welcome to Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host Luke Cutford and special guest, the fifth Sci Guy, no offense. Hey. Number two. This week we're talking about social styles and regulation in relationships, but first we have a wee YouTube comment. This one says, redistribute the ADHD in all caps. <laughs> that would have been me. Well, it's from no offence, yeah? That was a quote from Luke Cutforth over here. Yep. I, I just I co- stand copied by it. it. But before we get into the show, we've got a question for you to answer, and you can answer that in the YouTube comments or over on Spotify. And if you're not on either of those places, well, here's what you do. Raise a child. It's going to be hard. It's going to be rough. You're going to love that child unconditionally. Um, Sometimes you might not feel that way, but you always will. And when that child grows up after you've, you know, uh, raised them from an egg or however kids work, (laughs) they will have the answer to your question deep within them. Send that child to us and, um, well, I guess we'll get the answer. The question is, what's your attachment style? (laughs) Secure. Is it? I've listened to your music. Uh, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, I have. I yeah. That sounds very convincing. I have great. My parents are great. I have a great relationship with them. I'm just not secure in myself. I think is what is what is what you're hearing. Luke, what's your attachment style? I don't know what they are, so I can't really tell you. I'm afraid. Well, Luke, you'll be about to find out what they are right now. What's attachment theory? Do either of you know? Okay, so this it sounds like one of those things that's not a real thing. Like it's all a bit woo wooey. And it's not very precise. It doesn't really predict for anything. But I also think probably it's not that. And it probably actually is a, is a real thing. I know the answer. Okay, Ooh. I'm going to respond to what Luke said. Then you can give the answer. I also thought that this was just nonsense. Like uh, kind of like Myers-Briggs personality types or the five love languages, both of which we've done episodes on, mm. by the way. I thought it was more akin to that, where it was coming from a non-science angle and you know trying to pull in the sort of scientific stuff. But no, this is this has been science from the start. I had no idea. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I just thought it was like another like brand of horoscopes. Mm. You know, this is my attachment style. I am a Libra Pisces. That means something. But I don't know what. Go on no. then. Uh, what <laughs> is it? Style, though? So some psychology guy was like, right, I'm going to figure this out. We've got some problems in the world. People arguing all the time. Let's see how we can, you know, sort that out. He said, uh, so there's this theory uh, that uh, your relationship with your first caregiver uh, has an impact on the rest of your relationships and the rest of your life. So if you have a bad relationship with your mummy and daddy or gender neutral parent from birth, um, you will have issues in your adult relationships. That sounds like it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it sounds like you don't need a scientist to say that, you know? Yeah, well, I said it I right I said now. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if we go from Britannica, their definition of attachment theory is the theory that humans are born with a need to form a close emotional bond with a caregiver and that such a bond will develop during the first six months of a child's life if the caregiver is appropriately responsive. Very interesting, right? You know what yeah. I mean? that means? No airing your baby's texts. Oh, we're like ignoring them. I yeah, was thinking like that. airing bad laundry. Like, look at this text my baby sent me. <laughs> you said so needy. Don't so ghost your child. <laughs> <laughs> you said laundry. I just pictured a child doing like, doing this, getting all the water off it. So, uh, the history of attachment theory. You kind of got into this a little bit. Do you know the name of the guy that developed it initially? Bowlby. That is so true. It was John Bowlby. Um, and I'm glad you said it because I did not look up how his name was pronounced. Was it Bowlby? Bowlby. Well, if Bowl- you got it wrong, blame Noah. So <laughs> you're um, yeah. the science man, not the name man. Am okay. I? Right. Yeah, you're the you're the one you're I the one out words. there collecting names. Yeah, how many do you need? Um, <laughs> two. <laughs> <laughs> Noah, I think. Noah and Fins. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he basically developed this theory, like you were saying, Noah. Um, he was looking at how when infants were removed from their parents, that they would kind of go a little bit nuts. You know, they'd be crying as babies are wont to do, looking for their parents as one is wont to do when one has lost something one wants. Um, And they basically would try to avoid being separated from their parents and try and get back to their parents once sort of separated or once they're back in some kind of proximity with them. So clingy. Yeah, God. specific barriers put in place between the baby and the parent that the baby wouldn't go through. So like a hurdles or something. <laughs> like yeah. a wall. Was this a, like get, a, a baby Olympics, a, Corey? Did they get through a brick wall? Like, would they swim? So to my understanding, um, they would just have the mother leave the room. Mm. So I guess the barrier you're talking about would be a door. Did any babies manage to get to their parents? 
that, so, like those cats so that I, can I, open okay, doors right. on TikTok. May I? I feel like we're misunderstanding what's happening here. This is not a baby Olympics where we separate babies from their parents and the first one to get back to their parents wins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. would have thought that would be more entertaining. Can that be the quick fire quiz instead this this week? <laughs> Which of you can get cl- back to your parents as quickly as possible? Yeah. That's just because you'd win that right now. You'd win that. Oh, I'm going to see my parents tomorrow, so uh, I would win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so um, yeah, no, it's not about testing babies to see how quickly they can get back to their parents. <laughs> it's about um, removing... <laughs> <laughs> removing uh, babies from their caregivers to see how they react. So the idea initially was that these sort of reactions were to sort of defense mechanisms that were sort of trying to get rid of emotional pain. But if you look across like loads of mammal species, you will find that, you know, that is that is like sort of consistent across mammals, right? That babies will try to get back to their parents mm. um, and they will they will be in a state of sort of distress when removed from their caregivers, you know, like uh, at a certain point. Um, and essentially crying and searching are the two sort of main responses. Does that make sense to either of you? It makes total sense. I'm really confused. Can you give an explanation as to why crying and searching might be something that a baby does? To avoid emotional pain. <laughs> I was joking when I said I was confused. I thought you were going to, it was funny to me. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to be nice and protect your emotions, and there you are. Just no, my emotions are fine. <laughs> are mine. Ah. So, do either of you have any idea why that might be the case? Why crying and searching might be things that babies do when removed from a caregiver? Well, the crying helps be- helps parent find you, mm-hmm. and the searching helps you find parent. Yeah, that's... Two, there are two people involved in this. And why is finding why is finding caregiver a good idea? Because you are useless. You are a little baby. You can't do anything. Pathetic. <laughs> Very hurtful words, you guys. Very hurtful. But, uh, no, but like, you like, so like, small. <laughs> you can't I'm do big anything. Boy. I can do lots of things. Why are you being so cruel to me? Why are you being cruel to me specifically? Cry about it. Go look for your mum. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, during ah. the searching mode. Woo. Right, so I'm going to get back <laughs> to this if you're done with your nonsense now. Yeah, the idea is that this would have um, evolved basically because it is useful in terms of if you are loud and staying in one place, you're easy to find, like a smoke alarm. Um, or <laughs> if, you're, if you're looking um, you know, around to find something uh, that you've lost, you might find you it. You might find it, like a smoke alarm. Um, <laughs> you could lose a smoke alarm. You're a top 20 <laughs> science podcast. <laughs> <laughs> like if you are loud, people can find you easy. Mm. Like science. Alarm. Sources in the description. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> citation needed. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, the idea the idea is that that was sort of naturally selected to um, sort of help survival to keep uh, you know infants and babies and whatnot close to the folk that are going to be mm. stopping them from dying. You know. Yeah. So there's loads of babies that didn't try and look for their parent and didn't make any noise. Well, look, I mean, they weren't very successful. I guess, uh, evolutionarily speaking, at some point, yes, there must have been some mammalian species that didn't. Maybe there was a mammalian species that didn't cry or didn't cry as much, you know? Mm. And that, like, whatever um, caused that would have been selected against, yeah. But, I mean, if we look across the entire sort of animal kingdom, this sort of parenting that mammals, um, and I guess some birds do, uh, you know, I, that we do, is not you know, the norm necessarily, or it's not um, a standard uh, that all animals sort of mm. match, right? Specifically reptiles uh, and amphibians, a lot of them, they just, they're like, oh, I, blunt, I did all the birthing. Uh, so you're on your own now, yeah. right? There's lots of cute videos of ducks doing this though, so. Well, ducks are birds. That's true. The ones that I, was I mentioned thinking earlier. Of the, I was just thinking about mammals, sorry. <laughs> 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 Penguins, I think. Oh, that's birds. <laughs> well, a bird, yeah, yeah. Doesn't, yeah. This doesn't feel like a bird, but it's a bird. So moving on a- again, <laughs> um, attachment and detachment. Does that mean anything to either of you? Yeah, you, you, you're attached to something. You can become detached from it. What do you mean? Does it mean anything? No, I got you on this episode because you demanded to be on it because you you liked and yes, knew about the attachment question theory. Question was so open. Okay, so attachment is basically, I guess, exactly what you're describing. Uh, being attached and so when you are away from something you want to be back at it Um, like emotional attachment as opposed to like physically being attached to something Um, and then detachment is is that like the the state of not being with the caregiver or is that like the state of like not caring anymore because you've given up 
uh in it just everything doesn't matter and you've sort of emotionally numbed yourself and so you don't try like when you leave babies to cry themselves out you know that horrible don't process where you're like method. oh that, that process yeah. that we probably should not be doing and there's been i think quite a bit of evidence for quite a while that is that it's yeah. not great for babies i've, I've yeah. heard that they like they stop crying eventually just because it hurts so much yeah, do you know what? like we'll it hurts their the throats stages. We'll go through the stages, oh. yeah. And you know, that's the interesting thing, right? We've done this on the podcast before, where we've, um, <laughs> where we've sped up or uh, pitched up uh, me pretending to cry. And I don't think people realize that mm. babies, when they're crying, it is just a baby like shouting, uh. like yeah. It, like, uh. If you pitch down a baby, if you pitch down a baby crying, it sounds like a person shouting. So they're just shouting. They're just small, and so their voices are yeah that high. And it sounds weird. It to sounds have to like bring an up. adult man going. Like he's just like bashed his shin and going, ah. Yeah, like, ah. ah, ah. And like shouting, right? <laughs> and like, it's it's weird. I It's weird to feel the need to mention this, but I just think people don't really register that the only difference between a baby crying, I guess, and an adult sort of shouting and making that noise is that babies are smaller and so make it Oh, that makes pitch. it actually kind of more sad. Yeah, that right? They're just going, ah, ah, yeah. Like, ah. Literally, they're just <laughs> screaming. I like that, like, babies specifically have very shrill screaming <laughs> voices because it means their parents are more likely to hear them because it's like a certain frequency. Do you think in the past there were babies with really low voices <laughs> that just didn't? <laughs> uh, uh, mom! Mm. Like, which, way, <laughs> which way is it? Is it more that, is it not more that the parents who are more sort of attuned to that sort of mm. frequency are less likely to have their babies eaten by a crocodile. Or maybe they're just that's, disgusted that's the, that's the by the selective children's pressure, low by voice. the way. The universal selective pressure, babies being eaten by crocodiles. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know. Like, which way does it go? I mean, it's probably both both things, right? Yeah, I'm guessing babies like sort of uh, like move towards a niche, like a, a frequency that there wasn't a lot of interference in, mm. uh, which cats also then joined them in, bastards. Yeah. Uh, and then also parents, like the parents that were particularly attuned to the frequency of their child. But then interestingly, there are like, pet, there are like animals, I don't know if we do it, but like animals where like they can differentiate the cry of their baby from other babies. Mm. Especially, I think maybe it might be penguins, I can't remember, where like if you like yeah. have your baby with loads of other babies, like you, you all sort of like hang out together with all your babies in a big sort of baby party, then you need to be able to differentiate your baby's cry from other babies' cries. So you they can. It's it's amazing. Can we not can humans not do that? I mean, I don't have a baby, so I don't know. Um, I don't know that I mean, I don't know. Maybe well we'll find out one day when we have baby, but like When you um, and I have baby me together. And, me and Corey have had a baby. Congratulations. I didn't know. We'll do a scientific test to see if we can tell it from other babies' cries. Yeah, well, after the test to figure out how the two of us managed to produce it. <laughs> I could I yeah. could make the baby cry if you needed help with that. Well, how would you do that? Oh, you just uh like just his mean, presence. Mean, cruel cruel <laughs> words mostly. Cruel words. Cruel, cruel, mean mean thoughts and words. Oh you're really insecure about yourself. You should be. I don't you think right that will work that. on a baby, no. If I say it enough. Well it works on the baby he sees in the mirror every day. Anyway. <laughs> um <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that sort of process um of attachment, detachment. Uh essentially um, Bowlby kind of brought it down to asking whether um, if the attachment figure is nearby, accessible and attentive. A lot of what I've got here is coming from Britannica and a few other places, by the way. So head down to you know the sources to find all of that out. But yeah, it's it, the idea is if they're nearby, accessible, attentive, right? So you could be nearby and not accessible, right? The baby's not able to get to you because there's a barrier in between, as Noah was pointing, like hurdles. Little baby hurdles. Like baby a cot. can't get over them. What is a cot but baby hurdles? Don't give them baby ideas. cage. It's baby baby, baby cage. cage. That's the topless true. Topless baby cage. Well, the babies don't need to be topless in the cage. But the cage itself. <laughs> topless is... baby cage. It's not weird for a baby to be topless. In fact, it's very normal for a baby to be top. Don't make this weird. Why are you putting them in cages then? It's very normal, Cory. Because they can try to try to escape, Luke. <laughs> try to run away or crawl away or roll away. Um, so baby hurdles, as we were saying, um, you know, there could be something that, like some kind of barrier that's making them not accessible um, and attentive, right? You know, they could be accessible. You could be nearby them, but they could be a terrible parent. Um, that's a possibility also. Or, you know, they could have something else going on. You know, parents can't be there for the kids all the time. Babies are very needy, Luke. <laughs> anyway, um, the idea the idea is that um, if the answer to that question is yes, then you're going to feel good, you know? Name some good feelings you might feel if your uh, parental figure, like, you know, is nearby accessible and attentive. Safe. Really? Yeah. That must be nice. Com no? Comfortable. <laughs> oh, wow. God, wish I had that. Uh, any more? Not anxious. Uh. Uh. Secure. 
Oh wow! All of these seems like seem like lovely things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it it sort of results in um, a feeling of being loved, confident, secure. Um, and you know, if you're if you're feeling confident and secure and safe, how do you think that impacts your sort of behaviour, specifically as a baby? You take risks. What? Yeah, actually, <laughs> not genuinely. Yeah, right. Because as a baby, um, you don't understand anything. And you know, even some adults understand very little, Noah. And you know, so what that leads to is them exploring their environment, putting things in their mouths, you know, just trying to figure stuff out. Mm. And a baby is more likely to be sort of, I guess, exploratory mm. would be would be the word. Um, if they if they have that secure attachment with um, with a sort of a parental figure or a, a caregiver, right? Because I mean, it makes it makes sense because you know, if you're not worried about sort of survival or you're like, I feel safe, then you're more able to be like, oh, well, let's see what this thing is because I feel safe. Yeah. But if you're scared and you're like, oh, I don't know, like I don't have any like safety net or like there's nothing here to protect me, you're not going to be like looking out for more stuff because you're going to be scared. Yeah. I suppose if you if you frequently, I don't know how baby psychology works. I don't know how smart they are. But like if you... I don't think they're very good at psychology, Luke. I think the field is primarily <laughs> filled with adults. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's from, from the studies that I've been looking at. Yeah, not a lot of uh, baby representation in there. All right. Well, more research is needed. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, if, you're, if you frequently find yourself like your caregiver has left and you frequently find yourself back in like that searching mode, I guess you're also constantly anticipating that you might the, the parent might leave and so not only do you feel less safe to do things but you're also constantly anticipating not only that you will be that you are in searching mode but that you will be in searching mode mm. and so you can't ever like you can't ever chill out because you you might suddenly be unsafe if you if you stop paying attention so you're yeah. looking for obstacles to overcome and they're not coming because you're a baby are you also like more likely to like make friends in school and preschool because you're more Comfortable. Oh, I never did that, so I'm not really sure. No, um, <laughs> make, make friends. Nah, mate, nah. But uh, to be honest, right? Like, we'll get to the we'll get to the sort of um, ramifications of this in just a sec. I just want to go through that process we were talking about um, leading up to detachment, so we can see whether Luke's answer was correct or not. <laughs> because I'm sure we've all forgotten what it was. Uh, but yeah, no. The idea, the idea, basically behind this is that if you don't have an, a strong attachment or a good attachment to um, a parental figure, uh, sort of, or a caregiver rather, you know, at that, that sort of critical period, it's going to have an effect on just how you deal with relationships and how you deal with things uh, going uh, going forward from that. So if we sort of look at it as separation and then despondency, then detachment, those would be sort of three broad stages of what happens mm. when um, a, a sort of child is separated or doesn't have um, that sort of uh, affirmative answer to the question that Bowlby posed, you know, the sort of, um, is a caregiver nearby accessible and attentive, right? If the answer is no to that, then this will be sort of the experience, right? So what happens when you you basically, you know, let's, you take a kid away from their uh, caregiver, their parent? Well, they scream. Yeah. Like, like quite loudly and they wriggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they, yeah, they basically give off the idea that they're not having a good time. They let everyone know about it. Um, and this is, like, this can happen even if, you know, it's, you're with a stranger or whether the, the kid is alone, right? Um, and, Bowlby's ideas behind this were essentially what we've kind of already touched on, which is if you are allowed, you will be found, right? It is it is beneficial to your survival if when separated from a caregiver that you make it known because, you know, maybe they're busy. Maybe they haven't noticed that the baby's just kind of disappeared. And, you know, especially with sort of um, us as humans, we don't like we don't cling as well as some other mammals or primates specifically. We don't cling as well as some other primates do. Mm. Do you know what I mean by that? Mm. You're very clingy, yes. Don't know about that. As babies, I should yeah. say. Okay, right. How about well, this? But I think there are some um are there not some like tribal communities where like the mother like literally has the baby like attached to them at like at the breast mm. for like six months or something. And they literally just carry them around all day doing all their normal stuff that they do, but the baby's literally always attached to them. Yeah, attached to them. I mean I maybe maybe that's yeah. the case, maybe not. Um but yeah, like being attached, like having the baby close by is is a thing that you need to kind of actively do. Yeah. Whereas with a lot of sort of other primates, oh. they will cling. Right? Oh, you um, mean literally. And, okay. Yeah. And if we talk about like sort of other sort of mammals, if we talk about sort of horses Monkey. and 
Well, no, because I've just spoken about primates. I'm saying other mammals. <laughs> <laughs> like quite literally. The one that... <laughs> We've both done it now. No, no, no. Yeah. I've mentioned birds. <laughs> just the one. Um, no. Um, like, <laughs> like uh, so let's say like, uh, you know, giraffes or horses or whatever. Um, they're able to sort of run, like get up and walk and move in mm. that way um, pretty, pretty uh, quickly, right? And um, with primates, they tend to cling for a while. And with humans and, you know, other sort of mammalian infants apparently as well, but we're talking quite specifically about humans here. Uh, with humans, when like they're separated, they will scream and want to be found because you want to be close to the caregiver. That's kind of what I'm talking about there, bringing in all the other animals, that all of these are things that keep you close uh, to your caregiver, make you like you know able to be looked after by them. Um, and so because babies are, honestly, they the babies will just die if left unattended you know like mm. you you look at a baby the wrong way and it's like oh great now it broke you gotta gotta do a lot of work to fix that right like babies are hardy they got a few bounces in them definitely but they're also very easy to break like that's the that's the main thing there and so they need other people to care for them so that doesn't happen um and we know this this is all very obvious but this is the sort of evolutionary pressure to make sure that that happens that's the idea there right um and so when you're separated, that's what happens. There's just this immediate sort of protest to it. Um, and then if you go sort of past that, if you're screaming and you're crying and that that stops, that's not working, you know, um, they're not going to continue doing that. Uh, the second stage would be sort of despondency or despair. And at that point, um, they just do nothing, really. It's kind of what you were talking about earlier, Luke, where they just kind of sit, they go silent. And they don't do anything. Can you think of why that might be useful? Like after you've been screaming and crying and making a whole bunch of noise to suddenly go quiet and not move. Maybe they think they're annoying their parents or their screams and yells <laughs> are... And what would you do? If you give me a face. I mean, if I was a baby, I was screaming all the time and nothing happened. I'd be like, okay, I'll stop the screaming. Maybe the screaming scared them off. Maybe I they don't respond I, to screams. I think, I, I'm just, it's more that your attachment style probably isn't as secure as you were saying up top. But, no. um. Well, I think I think the only thing about that now, the reason I find it funny is because I think that requires too much complex thought on the part of the baby. Um, because I don't think they yet will be thinking of the parent as mm. like another person with its own wants and needs and Fair. thoughts. Um, but um, I would say maybe because it makes you vulnerable to predators. Yeah. 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 Ah. So, yeah, if we're talking about that sort of evolutionary pressure, right? If you're screaming and crying and no one's come to get you, if you keep on screaming and crying, someone's coming to get you. And it might not be the person <laughs> that you want, right? It might be that crocodile we were mentioning earlier. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, if, you, if you think about a baby in an environment where um, it's not built for a baby, you know, right? Um, it could be the forest floor. It could be anywhere else um <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah um moving around the law and screaming it's gonna potentially cause injury i mean the screaming you know um obviously attracting other predators or whatnot but um the moving around right the babies don't have much control of themselves they can maybe crawl and stuff. sometimes they can't lift their head up like it depends on how old they are right <sighs> um and if you're in that situation and you're kind of rolling around and moving around, there's sharp stuff, there's dangerous mm. stuff. You could be on a cliff's edge, a very, very terrible parent leaving a baby on a cliff's edge, you know, and then pop, oh, God, left the keys. I have to pop back to the house. You stay here. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, do you know what I mean? So it, it makes sense uh, to then uh, go quiet and stay still. And that's kind of like advice that's, that's given, you know, uh, whether you're lost at sea or whether you're lost, you know, anywhere else. Um, Stay put. <laughs> become despondent baby. Well, yeah, yeah. Stop being a little baby and become a baby. <laughs> so yeah, you stay still and stay quiet. And then if that doesn't work, you know, if the baby's still um, separated from the caregiver at that point, um, then, you know, they'll then move into sort of detachment, right? So after that sort of period of uh, sort of depression, despair, despondency, whatever you want to call it, um, if that sort of continues without any sort of... Um, Sort of reconciliation with the parent, um, then th you'll you'll enter sort of detachment, which is essentially the baby just getting on as normal. Um, so just trying to be independent, do their own thing without wow. um, help from the caregiver. Um, and the idea behind that is that essentially, right? Like, w what else are you gonna do, right? Like, okay, well, I screams. I've done that. Step one, check. <laughs> I've sat still and done nothing. Step two, a check. I'm going to like you know I mean it's 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 almost the same as like if you were if you were suddenly stuck upon a desert island yeah. Luke 
what would what would what well, you, yeah, you would do? Yeah, firstly you try and make like a flare or like um, spell SOS out in pebbles on the sand or the other things they do in the TV shows. Uh, and then I guess I'd be like, oh God, all hope is lost. I'm so depressed. There's no point. Um, and then I might be like, right, is there any nice fruit around? <laughs> and then go eat some fruit. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. That's, yeah. the, that's the three stages. <laughs> that's, Noah, you, you've been watching a lot of Lost recently. Is that is that what you would do? I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd probably do the same. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd agree. Yeah. So the, the, if you think of it like that, you know, um, you try and you try and get help. Help doesn't come, and you're like, okay, quiet, because might be more might be more dangerous, and also I'm feeling sad and whatnot. Um, and then after that, after a period of like you know, um, just nothing happening then that sort of bond, you kind of sever that emotional bond there, right? Um, and you you kind of get rid of it almost, right? Mm. Like you don't then have that close bond with the caregiver, even if the caregiver were to come back. Wow. Because you've gone through that sort of process. And um, Bowlby kind of thought of it as um, basically you can't form new attachments until you've sort of shed those old ones. You just get rid of the ones that you've got with the previous caregivers um, that have left you in that situation. Um, and then, you know, you might be, then be able to form attachments with new caregivers, right? So let's say another, like, uh, you know, two an folks that are Uncle. Aren't, well, yeah, maybe an uncle, but also just like anyone sort of going by that are, that isn't your initial caregiver, even if you were to, <laughs> say, not know them, right? Yeah. Um, like you would then be able to form that emotional bond with them and they could then be your sort of caregiver. And that emotional bond is important, obviously. It's a case of like, how do you how do you like how do infants deal with this? And we're talking about infants here, to be to be clear. How do infants deal with this situation where um, their caregiver has kind of essentially been removed from them? Like, how do they carry on mm. surviving? That's interesting because my instinct would be that they would actually like lose faith in attaching at all. Mm. Um, like they would not be able to. And maybe 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 that's what we're going to explore. Maybe that maybe they're less trusting of future attachments than they would otherwise have been. I'm sure that is. It's part of it. Mm. But it's interesting that they still have the instinct to attach. And it's probably in part, maybe like inversely correlated to like how capable they are. Like if they're really young, if they're like a, still like an absolute tiny baby, you can try all you like to do what you can mm. to stay alive. But there's really nothing. You, your, your best bet is still, hello, would you like to care for me? <laughs> because I can't even crawl yet. I'm very cute. Look at me. Look at my little face. Is it not strange that my head is most of the size of my body? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, like spot on. And yeah, I mean, like, that's sort of attachment through to sort of detachment. Um, and the idea kind of didn't stop there. Do either of you know anything about Mary Ainsworth? No. Yeah, I remember the name. Dangling Ling, is that the ad bell? I think it is, but it's it's rather quiet this time. Well, Luke, we want to keep a big old secret about this Psy Guys merch. Yes, please do not tell anybody and do not purchase any of it. Otherwise, people will find out. They might see you wearing our merch or displaying our merch and think, oh, wow, what a cool person. And I'll tell you this, as a cool person myself, having people think you're a cool person can be very, very stressful. Yeah, we can't have that. We also can't have you supporting the show to exist that you're enjoying right now. Yeah, so absolutely under no circumstances should you go to normalcitizen.store and pick up some Psy Guys merch. Some Psy Guys merch like beanies and posters and t-shirts and calendars and cool stuff like that definitely don't go to that store and buy that goodness me that's an awful lot of stuff that i'm not going to purchase absolutely luke now let's get back to the show before anyone listens to us god i really hope we got away with that one mary ainsworth did she come up with like three different attachment styles is that her yeah so she was the one that kind of uh, picked up where bobby left off and went into the different styles of attachment and you know it's really one of those things where you come across this, right? And a bloke has just done a bunch of work. And then, you know, a woman a woman comes along and does a lot more work. A lot of the time, that woman will just be kind of like forgotten. Mm. But there is a lot, when you, when you sort of read about this, yes, there will be places that are just saying, this is John's thing. This is John Bowlby. He did this. But a lot more, I found, were kind of putting them on par with each other um, because she built off of his work, but built it kind of more to what it is uh, today, right? Um, and he, they were colleagues, um, and she then started, like, actually studying this. So beforehand, it was Bowlby just kind of being like, this is an observation. 
this is what I think. You know, this is this is the situation. I think he was maybe doing some experiments as well, but it was uh, Mary Ainsworth who specifically started studying, um, like sort of rigorously scientifically, um, infants separated from their parents. Um, and that's how we kind of got the idea of attachment styles that we have today. Uh, do you know about the strange situation? Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell me about the strange situation? I probably don't remember specifics of it. I, I remember it being like a large scale study where they put a bunch of parents in their own room and then the parent left and they studied what the baby's reaction were and then they put them into different categories of like how attached they were. Yeah. Uh, but they were also, they were told like, don't respond to your baby's screams. Is that... <laughs> you made it sound very dark at the end. Like, yeah, no, that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like they're torturing the babies and they're like, don't yeah. listen, don't listen to the baby. Don't, he's making it up, don't worry. Shh, don't worry, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, it wasn't... Uh, well, it was in some way baby torture, as far as this podcast goes. Emotional baby torture, yeah. I, Do you know what? I was very chuffed with how they treated these babies in this, because a lot of the time when we're looking at how babies are treated in science, it's they're they're mentally torturing them just to see what happens um, with a fear response or they're raising them with a chimp that at some point will be able to rip their face off <laughs> oh, and say, this is your this is your sibling um, or other, other such things um, anyway they didn't do any of that to a baby it's exactly what Noah was saying they had a room um, they, they probably had many rooms but let's just talk about one room for now they had a room they had uh, parents um, I think in this case it was mostly mothers or it might have been entirely mothers but uh, at the very least there were a fair few mothers there. Um, it does say parents a lot, and this this does this can apply to fathers. But because of how um, babies tend to form that sort of closer emotional bond uh, with um, the mother, I think they were looking specifically at mothers. Yeah, they were looking specifically at mothers. And I I don't know whether this is sort of a genuine specific thing of this is how babies attach to mothers, or whether mm. it's just that mothers are more likely culturally, you know, to sort of um, be the ones that have that sort of high level of interaction mm. with the babies and therefore uh, what? It's because, like a, of, well, because of yeah it's like a primary caregiver thing right yeah. rather than it being a mom well, it's like yeah. the first attachment that you form well yeah and mothers tend to be you know the ones that are breastfeeding the kids yeah. usually so or bottle feeding or feeding the kids and that obviously forms um, a bond there as well so they took a bunch of mothers they got a bunch of babies and they were like let's see what happens uh, when we when we take these two groups apart when we remove them from each other they basically just want to see how uh, kids reacted sort of how um, they regulated themselves what they did um, and you know all of that sort of stuff so there was 12 to 18 month old kids so that's one year to like a year and a half right mm -hmm. yes I can do maths that's that's maths uh, and so yeah um, they, they took the mums and they took the babies, they put them in a room, um, and they ran this test. So this was in 1971. They had about a hundred, um, middle-class American families, um, mothers and infants. And it was, they basically designed this so that they could, um, figure some stuff out. Uh, like the actual quote that I've got in my notes here is the strange situation procedure was designed to be novel enough to elicit exploratory behavior and yet not so strange that it would evoke fear and heighten attachment behavior at the outset. So essentially, like, it's got to be unfamiliar enough that this baby looks at it, like, is in the situation is like, I want to see what's going on here. I want to learn, but not so unfamiliar that the baby's like, mommy, please don't let me be in this place alone. I am terrified. I don't want to learn because it's scary. Yeah, it's just like they're not holding the mom up at gunpoint. They're just, <laughs> they're just telling her, hey, you may want to leave a little. I love how you think the baby would be like uh, understanding what gunpoint meant. Well, American babies, probably. <laughs> um, Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So they've got, uh, they've got a nine by nine foot um, space, which is divided into 16 squares. Now that's just so they could like sort of look at where the baby's going, right? So they've got a four by four sort of um, separation of these squares, right? So baby's in um, one A and then baby moves. Oh, now baby's in two A. Like you know, a game like, of chess. Yeah. Baby yeah. to two A. <laughs> when I make my move. <laughs> <laughs> Deary me. So th that was just to track where the babies were going. So there was a chair that had toys on it and there was another, there was another set of chairs for um, the mother and the stranger. Now the stranger was a stranger to the baby. Baby did not know the stranger, um, as is probably explanatory by the name. So the baby's put in the middle. Um, the mother and the stranger 
basically get given a set of instructions that they've got to follow out over um the over the sort of course of the experiment so the kid basically plays for 20 minutes um and the caregivers and strangers come um in and out of the room um basically just sort of how, it, the idea behind this is sort of to like replicate what the kid's life might actually be right right the kid is playing in a room um a stranger's coming in and out the caregiver's coming in and out the kids kind of left their own devices for a little bit whilst they're playing but um it's not it's like it's not an unfamiliar situation it's not a terribly unfamiliar or unrealistic rather situation for a child to be in mm. yeah. no mum goes to the toilet mums go to the toilet mm, they piss too Wow. Yeah. Thank goodness I've learned something today. Ouch! <laughs> um, so, um, they they basically were on the the sort of scientists were on the other side, of a, of like a one way mirror, you know, um, a one way mirror. Yeah, one way mirror. People say two way mirror, and I'm like, that's a window. That's what <laughs> that's, that's what that is. Uh, so um, they're on, they're on the other side of a one way mirror, so they could watch the kids without the kids knowing that they're being watched, right? Um, because crucially, if the kid is able to see. A room full of strangers. Yeah, watching them. It's probably going to influence their behavior. So the, the kid plays for 20 minutes. They sit and watch that. Um, and then um, there are different sort of things that go on. Um, different sort of episodes. It's described as in uh, my notes. So uh, the first one, mother, baby, and experimenter. So uh, the mum takes baby into the room and with uh, an observer um, walking in with them. Then the observer leaves. Um, and that that's less than a minute, right? So basically they walk in together with the mum and the baby, and then the observer, they, they go, they leave. Um, and then the mum is alone with the baby, that's uh, the second one. Uh, she puts the baby in a designated area and then sits quietly, only interacting if the baby initiates. Again, I'm reading this verbatim, you can find all our sources in the description. And that's uh, three minutes. Then number three, the stranger <gasps> joins the mother and infant. So stranger comes in, sits quietly for a minute, then starts chatting with the mum for another minute before mm, kind of getting up close to the baby holding up a little toy, you know, as you do. Um, and um, after the third minute, the mum leaves the room. <gasps> but um, it's sort of specified as discreetly, so it's not like she's making a big old fuss about it. She's kind of like, you know, <laughs> just like... <laughs> I'll be gone then. <laughs> I hope you're okay without me. So the baby doesn't notice essentially, right? Like, <laughs> um, Don't so the, cry. <laughs> so the baby's playing, mind you. Um, what do you think the sort of outcomes could be here if, uh, you know, all of these things have happened? We're at the point where the mother has discreetly left the room and the baby is playing, not necessarily having immediately noticed that the mother is gone. Well, it depends on the baby, really. Yeah, if, it's, so... if, it's a, if it's a baby whose mummy is not that nice, it's probably more scared of strangers because it mm. probably doesn't have that much trust in them. So if, if, a, if a baby is scared of strangers, the baby won't have a very good time alone with a stranger. But if a baby... Ooh! Ooh, but you said earlier, if a... A baby has cried, mum doesn't come, stops crying, doesn't care anymore. Maybe if a baby is so detached from its mother, it will make best friends with a stranger. <laughs> Maybe, actually. I'll so just Imagine I'll... if they ran this uh, experiment, like, so far, that yeah. all the babies decided to be adopted by the stranger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to go home with a stranger now. This is your new... <laughs> The, the baby looks up at the mum like, I don't even know you anymore. Get It'd be out of really here. embarrassing as the parent, you know, to walk in like with the baby and have to leave, like go home to your no family baby. and be like, so baby chose someone else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is actually a sting operation for a bunch of people who didn't have babies but wanted babies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if the baby uh, was happy playing, the stranger did nothing. The baby um, sort of wasn't doing anything, just kind of went sort of quiet. The stranger would start to try to get them playing with the toys um, and if the baby started to you know, cry um, the stranger would then try to soothe them if they couldn't soothe the baby they would stop the stop the experiment right stop what well, stop the experiment they would stop that section there mm -hmm. stop that episode um, if the baby was uh, fine like after being comforted or whatnot um, they would carry on that on for th three minutes uh, then the mother comes back and the stranger leaves so the mum comes in stops in the doorway and then the baby, the the, the baby reacts to the mum being <gasps> in the doorway. Hello. Uh, <laughs> and then the stranger like kind of leaves again discreetly. Um, and the mother basically, she's not told what to do. I mean, again, reading verbatim from my notes, the subsequent actions of the mother were not predetermined except for the instructions that once the baby resumed playing with the toys, she would leave again, pausing to say, 
Bye bye. <laughs> uh, so this yeah, so this episode lasted uh, basically as long as it needed to. But you can kind of see you could you kind of building up a picture of what's going on here, right? So we put a baby in an environment, we get them to sort of play, get to understand the environment a little bit. They've seen the stranger as they're entering this place. Um and then they've been kind of tested just a little bit with like the caregiver, the mother, leaving uh briefly and then coming back and then announcing, you know, that she's leaving again. I'm off. <laughs> I guess I'll be I guess I'll be back at some point if anyone cares if, if you get so um, after that point the mother leaves um, and the baby's left completely alone so bear in mind um, up until here we're sort of uh, we've gone up past uh, episode 5 so we've gone from the mother and the baby um, and the experimenter entering um, and then uh, the mother and baby being left alone and then a stranger joining the mother and the baby, and then the mother discreetly leaving whilst the stranger's left alone with the baby, and now the mother's back with the baby and the stranger's left, and then episode six is where we just got to. Uh, the mother leaves, and the infant is by themselves, right? They're left alone. Now, um, they're left for three minutes or shorter, depending on how upset they get. <laughs> because again, as I said, this... this <laughs> This experiment actually seemed to care a little bit about the well-being of the infants that they were using. Um, and then episode seven, the stranger returns. Um, basically, <laughs> they come back, the stranger, without the mother. So the baby is now um, in the room alone with the stranger. Um, and again, they just do this for three minutes or shorter if the baby gets too upset. And then verbatim from my notes, once the mother and child reunion is noted, the scenario is concluded, right? So essentially what they've done here is put the baby in a bunch of different situations to kind of see how they react. They've tracked their movement. They've seen that they're playing. They've seen if they, if they can be soothed by others. Um, and the way that we sort of look at this is the caregiver is a secure base, right? So we can kind of see that they've gone through a few different sort of scenarios in this experiment to kind of see how the baby reacts to being left alone with a stranger, uh, you know, the mother leaving, all of these sorts of things, right? Um, and now the idea is that while, yeah, the kid is probably going to be at least a little bit upset by being left alone, um, how they react to that and how they sort of self-soothe and how they respond to these situations gives you an idea of sort of the kid's attachment style, mm. right? So the difference between how they react is based on these sort of um, attachment types. Like I've said, if you've got securely attached kids, they'll reduce their negative emotions by using their caregivers, right? So you need a secure base um, and they'll get back to doing whatever pretty quickly once um, once the, you know, the strange situation has concluded. So with these kids, you know, they'll... They'll be upset maybe once their, their mother's gone. They'll be soothed once their mother's back. But they'll be pretty quick in getting back to playing. Because they're like, oh, cool, you're here. I'm fine, right? Oh, it's me you'd come back. Yeah, exactly, right? It's almost like that sort of trust or faith there, right? You've got anxious resistant children. Do you know anything about anxious resistant or anxious avoidant? Those are two different categories, by the way. Anxious resistant. They're anxious about everything. They're scared of strangers, scared of their parents moving, but also not moving. They're scared of strangers, they're scared of their parents leaving, but also not that uh, helped by their parents returning. Yeah, no, so that's it. They basically stay upset, stay distressed. Um, they can have sort of negative reactions to um, <laughs> to their caregivers once they've returned yeah. as well, right? Mm. So it's like, okay, you've left, I'm upset, you're back, I'm still upset, why did you leave? Obviously. They hold grudges. <laughs> no, yeah. they hold no. grudges. Yes. I well, they're trying to... to teach the child, the parent, like you actually aren't allowed to leave. <laughs> I'm gonna be a real bitch about it if you leave. <laughs> you know the repercussions of your actions, mum. <laughs> I love the jokes. I'm loving the fun. I want to be clear to anyone that's listening that that's not why babies are doing that because they're spiteful. Um, <laughs> but Some babies are just dicks. Like, they're just rude. <laughs> so, yeah, the baby will stay upset if it's anxious resistant and they'll have some resentment <laughs> towards their caregiver. Um, anxious avoidant uh, children. Do you know anything about the anx anxious avoidant? Oh, style? God, they're, they, they're, their mood is not determined by what their parents are doing. Their mum will leave, they'll be like, meh. Mum will come back, they'll be like, meh. Yeah, so, I mean, they're, they're not outwardly, um, they don't show as much sort of outward yeah. emotion to them. You can see you can see sort of elevated heart rates, um, sort of things like that, but not the sort of visible necessarily crying and screaming and those obvious signs of distress. Um, and they, yeah, you're, you're, so, you're so right. They will just stay sort of, They'll keep them at arm's length, right? They'll keep the caregiver kind of <laughs> at arm's length. It's not very far. Uh, well, no, well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't touch me. 
for a baby. Stay away. <laughs> for a baby, that's very far. <laughs> You've got to, they're very small. Um, but no, uh, they're kind of the more self, uh, sort of, you know, self-starters, the self-reliant types, the ones that kind of are more independent is the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So those are the three main categories. I think there's another category as well, uh, but I don't really want to get into that because it wasn't super covered in this experiment, but there is sort of, how do I put it? It's kind of an all over the place one. Essentially, oh. the 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 fourth type, right, insecure um, attached, disorganized. I think it's described, and that's more sort of when a caregiver is sort of the source of sort of discomfort or distress. But also, what do you do when the thing that you want to soothe you is the thing that's making you need to be soothed? Mm. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, mummy shouts at me, but she also feeds me and puts me to bed. But she's also mean to me. But I kind of need her. Yeah, basically that. And so then, the, the you know, you can understand how that would result in a disorganized attachment style, right? Um, you basically just, you don't have resolution to things and you, it's this sort of really conflicting, contradictory, confusing sort of situation for an infant to be in. Oh my God, commitment issues as an adult, right? Yeah, I mean, potentially, yeah. And so that's where you're kind of getting into how these attachment styles as children uh, get into adult relationships. I'll just go through um, the sort of attachment styles um, again, just to make it clearer. So in 1970, in that 1970 um, sort of study, they they had three attachment styles. I want to kind of, the ones I went through uh, just earlier, they're type A, B, and C. So uh, type B would be secure, insecure, avoidant would be type A, and insecure, ambivalent slash resistant would be type C. Um, so we would now probably describe those as secure, anxious, resistant, and anxious, avoidant. And basically, uh, if we just run through kind of what goes on with the secure type, um, they are sort of distressed when the mother leaves, um, and they're sort of cautious around the stranger when the mother isn't there, but when the mother is there, they're more adventurous, they're more exploratory, they're, they're, they're more friendly to the stranger, right? Um, and when the mother returns, they're happy to see the mother, right? So on the reunion, they're like, oh, you're back. Mm. Nice. I was scared. Now I'm less so. Glad you're here. Glad to be with you. Um, and then, um, <laughs> and then um, basically, the idea here is that the that what we're talking about, the secure base, the safe base, that sort of thing, um, having the sort of parent as an anchor and using them uh, to find comfort and sort of the, uh, to have the sort of, you know, confidence to explore unfamiliar situations. Um, and then if we look at the resistant uh, type, uh, the sort of uh, type C ambivalent resistant or uh, anxious resistant, that would be really like a lot of distress when the mother's gone, avoiding the stranger, like to the point of being scared of them. Um, and then when they're reunited with the mother, kind of getting closer but not really like not really properly reuniting in my notes um it quite literally says uh the infant approaches the mother but resists contact may even push her away um and yeah when we move on to the anxious avoidant that's when the mum leaves they're chilling they're like yeah see ya. whatevs i'm i'm good i ain't crying i ain't stressed out basically no obvious signs of distress when the mother leaves right um and when um the stranger's there the infant's like fine like, when the stranger's there, they're just playing. It doesn't really make much of a difference to them. They're like, I don't, I'm not bothered. I'm going to keep on doing my thing. Um, and then when they're reunited with the mother, as we said, just don't really seem to care all that much, right? Um, and so um, another another thing on this as well is that the mother and stranger can soothe the, um, the avoidant, the anxious avoidant uh, type equally well so if if oh. the, so if the, when the when the mother leaves right and the stranger's alone with the kid and the kid if the kid is upset um then you know the stranger can soothe the kid about as well as the mother can soothe, soothe the kid yeah you're as good for me as a complete stranger yeah thanks basically, mom basically um and so that breaks down as 70 percent of them were secure 15 were resistant and 15 were avoidant yeah yeah, so, uh, and we've already gone into the fourth attachment style, disorganized. That was um, found in 1990, so about 20 years afterwards. Um, and again, that's more in a sort of situation where the caregiver is also the cause of a lot of distress. So mm. it's it's kind of an outlier of those ones. It operates a little bit differently. But then in the mid-1980s, that's when we kind of started talking about um, attachment styles relating to adults, like you were mentioning there. Ah, they were smart in the 80s. That's what I, that's what I heard about them. I feel like because I learned about this while I was in school, I was so interested in it. Obviously, don't remember everything. But now anytime I see anybody behave in a specific way, I'm like, oh, 
bad relationship with your parents. Hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're you're a bit too you're a bit too secure. You you've had your needs met. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I too no, secure. But then I also feel like I feel like if I met someone and asked them, I could guess. Mm. Like I I feel like like I'm not a scientist, but like it defo has an impact, right? I mean. Yeah, it can have an impact, right? That is that is the interesting thing. It's the, the question is sort of how much of an impact does it have and mm. sort of how long does that impact last? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, uh, the, the naming of it is kind of funny because, like, for example, when it says secure, the, the secure, quote unquote secure, is actually quite insecure in that the, the parent leaves and they're like, ah, yeah. that's mm. like, that's not being secure. But it's, it's to do with that attachment style. Whereas the kind of ambivalent, uncaring parents here, parents not there, whatever, I don't care. That on the surface looks like a secure baby because they're like, mm. the, the parent will come back, everything's going to be fine. Whereas actually it's probably on a deeper level, like it, it it makes no difference to me. I'm so used to uh, my parent not being here or for me that I've given up caring. Um, so it, ultimately, what's most important here is how that ripples down into your behavior and your attachment in adulthood, mm. because probably, I would guess, the child that actually is emotionally emotionally vulnerable as a baby, i.e. parent leaves and they cry, which is fine because mm. you're a baby, you can't do anything. <laughs> ends up being the secure adult um whereas the the kind of uh, oddly self um like self uh secure child i like they can kind of look after themselves they don't really care i i imagine that doesn't lead, even though they were so like self-reliant as a baby and you'd think that they'd be self-reliant in adulthood uh, it actually is a manifestation of a of an insecurity as opposed to a security which is weird i assume they probably just like push people away cuz they're like oh i don't need anyone I've got myself. Sigma male. Sigma male. <laughs> I, think the, I think the key point to sort of bear in mind with this is that um, the baby isn't sort of not distressed, the avoidant, um, the avoidant style. It's not that it isn't distressed. It's that it's not showing outward signs, yeah. of, right? Because there's so, no point, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, ex exactly, right? It's got to the point where it's like, well, it doesn't make a difference whether I do this or not. And again, it's really difficult to apply this sort of mind. It's like applying this sort of mindset to animals, right? Um, mm. Babies aren't necessarily going to be thinking like that. But th the key thing to take away there is that there are these internal signs of distress. You know, like you can see that the baby is distressed if you sort of check their heart rate or whatever. But you're not going to see that they're distressed by just watching them with the naked That's eye. That's so sad because it's almost like it's like they've given up. Like if you imagine the baby is like born, obviously we. Uh, this is me hypothesizing, me saying nonsense probably, I don't know. But if you imagine the baby is born with a few things that it's trying to sort of regulate to a certain mm. extent, like it's trying to regulate food, have I eat, am I hungry, am I warm, like really basic things. And one of those things might be, am I, like what's my proximity to my caregiver? Mm. If it's just like, the proximity to the caregiver, it might be like being monitored, like it's aware of where the caregiver is. Like mm. you say, it still has raised heart rate. It's just that it feels like there's nothing I can do. The, mm. the proximity to the caregiver, it might be far, it might be near, but when I cry, nothing changes. Yeah. So I give up trying to regulate that specific thing, Yeah. which is so sad. It's really sad, isn't it? Yeah, it, can, it, can, it's, it's, it sounds really sad. Yeah. Um, and the way that you're sort of talking about the secure baby sort of crying when the caregiver leaves, I think to view that less as like, oh, I am the only one that's distressed and more as a sort of like, I am distressed and so I'm going to do the thing that I do when I'm distressed, yeah. which is call out for help. Yeah. But that's essentially what it is, right? A baby crying is just like, help me, please, help, help me. Do, help, help, I, I need help. That's what's happening, right? And the, I think the, the key interaction to look at there is when the parent sort of returns or the caregiver returns, right? With the secure type, they're then soothed by the parent and they're mm. chill to explore when the parent's there. But with the sort of um, avoidant type, they're like, you know what I mean? When the parent returns or the caregiver returns, there isn't that sort of, any positive thing with the reunion and with the um sort of what's the other one the anxious um resistant type they sort of will push back against the caregiver returning right and so you can see that if we like maybe on the surface of it depending on how you describe it um the secure type could sound less um independent or less healthy than mm. <clears throat> you know the avoidant type but ultimately uh, when it comes to relationships we are social animals when it comes to relationships um the secure type seems to be what 
the secure type is the best one of the three, right? And it's a baby. It's a baby. <laughs> it's okay to be a baby for a bit. Like, yeah. you're useless, and that's fine. <laughs> you're a baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, how, this, how this sort of um, affects adults is uh, we kind of look at it mostly in terms of romantic relationships. And, uh, you know, it kind of makes some kind of sense there, right? That um, if you've got, like, a strong bond between you and your partner, um, you kind of rely on them in sort of not necessarily similar ways, but there are similarities in those relationships. Well, it's right? like trust. Trust, yeah. Mm. Um, but also, uh, you know, again, my notes, I've got some great um, examples here that I'll just read out for you. Um, close intimate body contact, um, feeling insecure when um, the other is inaccessible, sharing discoveries with each other, um, sort of feeling safe when the other is nearby and responsive, right? These are things that are consistent between infants and caregivers and um, often people in adult romantic relationships. I'm always sharing discoveries with my wife. No, but like, like, I learned this thing today and I'm going to talk about it too much. (laughs) I think that's something else. But um, yeah. Uh, And another one that I thought was really funny is baby talk, right? Adults... You maybe oh, talk people into their yeah, relationships. Yeah, God, people with. hate this so much. Yeah, what what's that? Uh, what's that symptom of? Well, I don't, I don't know. It's just, oh, right. it's just similarities oh, right. of. I, there was this, there was this girl in sixth form when I was in school, my first year of senior school in the boarding house, and every single night her boyfriend would come round, and everyone would be like, "Oh, that's Nikki." Her and her boyfriend speak to each other really weird, and I was like, "What?" They were literally like, "I love you, Henry. I oh, you looked oh, you looking so pretty today, Henry." Yeah. Don't do that in front of people. They're so securely attached, it makes me want to bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. Uh, so that was, I think, Hazan and Shaver that kind of uh, brought up these similarities there uh, between, um, you know, uh, romantic relationships and infant caregiver relationships. And the, the, kind of, the kind of where this goes is, right, well, if these relationships are similar, how much influence does the, you know, attachment style as a child, as an infant, um, how much influence does that have on your attachment style as an adult? And I mean, what do you what do you both think? Like, what would you hypothesize in this situation? I'd say that it has a lot of impact on it, but then also it doesn't really account for the fact that, like, between being a baby and being an adult in a relationship, there are tons of things that can happen in your life that completely put you off course. Yeah, no, exactly, right? And what we kind of see there is that if you're sort of secure, that would generally mean that from your previous experiences, you know that, like, well, if I just follow the rules, like quite literally it's described as the rules um, in my notes here. Um, basically, you can just say, hey, I have a problem um, and I, I, I would like this to be dealt with. Then you know that, that you're, you feel secure that that will lead to the problem being solved, right? Mm. And what that essentially can result in is healthy communication, right? So if you've got your uh, the person that you've got, you're sort of um, attached to, right? So let's say this is um, in... Uh, a parent-child relationship, like a caregiver, um, sort of infant relationship, or um, a romantic relationship, right? That partner or that parent is sort of the person that um, you bring your discomforts to, right? And you, they support you and they comfort you. That's what you want out of a partner and what you want out of a parent, right? Someone that you could be like, hey, I have this problem. Like, ah, I have a problem. And they help you, they comfort you, they help you feel better about it, right? That's something that you would generally want and secure individuals feel literally just secure and comfortable in bringing those things up which could result as i said in better communication and communication is key everything wonderful cool yeah (laughs) all of those and if you're avoidant how do you think that might affect adult relationships like how do you think avoidant folk might react oh well i mean too many ways to count i guess but Mm. like things like not trusting the other person or being clingy of the other person or um oh god too many there's so many pushing them away yeah. being like i don't need you even though i do yeah yes. so avoidant is generally like i have had to deal with my own things and i've you've essentially learned right well no one else is going to help me i'm going to help myself and so it can lead to bottling up of sort of uh problems or sort of like essentially trying to stop like bad things from happening when they happen. So again, in my notes, the use of self-reliant tactics to control and reduce negative affect when it arises. So basically any negative sort of responses that you get from others, um, just trying to limit that as much as possible. But then there's also, I think, almost the opposite as well sometimes where like you so expect someone's going to run away Mm. that you almost drive them away 
like so that you you have control over it isn't that a thing like yeah yeah essentially it's like trying to minimize distress as much as possible and if you're mm. doing that by being love like, me love me love me what? this is what the first six love months me. was like um <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, but if you're trying to limit distress as much as possible, um, then yeah, you can drive other people away or just keep a distance, especially if, you know, if you've got emotional issues, if you don't want to communicate those because, you know, the way that you are supposed to deal with those, the way that you're supposed to deal with those um, with this mindset is, you know, just avoiding the problem, essentially, mm. highly avoidant adults, right? Like that's what we're talking about. It's kind of in the name. And when it comes to anxious folk, um, that's essentially um, basically... Um, like worrying uh, <laughs> that attachment figures will never fully meet their persistent needs for comfort and support, right? So just like focusing on the thing that's bothering them, um, like thinking about it, ruminating on it. I've got on my notes. Um, and yeah, just worrying, like essentially anxiety. It all, it's all in the name there essentially, right? Mm. So secure, if you think of that as being able to like communicate the problems like and feeling comfortable that communicating the problems is going to solve them. Um, avoidant is more like uh, sort of self-sufficient in terms of like, I can just deal with this on my own. No, you can't. You're a person. You need other people to help you deal with things. Mm. Um, and sort of, uh, yeah, essentially just being independent uh, to a fault almost, right? And then anxious people, um, yeah, just get anxious, get stressed about mm. these things and don't, um, don't necessarily actually resolve anything. Get stressed about people um, not being able to resolve things, just like never feeling safe or comfortable yeah. or secure. Yeah. When you're talking about um, uh, like feeling like you can voice a thing and you'll be like supported, like you can share your feelings. Mm. One of my favorite like YouTube short subgenres is like, uh, these sketches of like I I in the sketch I saw, it's like this this lady going to speak to her partner, and being like, "This is a thing you're doing that's upsetting me," and then the partner being like, "Oh, that's totally understandable and valid. Like, oh, yeah, that's that's cool. Let's talk about it." And then her being like, "What? You're not going to tell me I'm stupid and my feelings are invalid?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then and be like, "No, no." And then all the comments are just like, "This is this is so nice. <laughs> it just feels so warm." <laughs> uh, yeah. No. I mean, and. It's it's really like we do see that there is a sort of an effect on uh, happiness and whatnot there, right? So if you're securely attached, you're more likely to experience uh, positive emotions in romantic relationships um, and fewer negative uh, fewer negative emotions um, compared to the other groups. And sort of your early attachment pattern does have an influence, as we said, on your sort of attachment style later in life, but it's not sort of set in stone mm. yeah. there are things that can change it and i think the way to view this is not sort of your um your style is set when you're an infant but more so that your methods of dealing with these sort of situations dealing with these sort of um, emotional attachments or these relationships is informed by your experiences mm. and so if your past experiences result in you you know sort of wanting to not wanting to but sort of you sort of being more avoidant or more anxious mm. then that's probably what you're going to be like but different experiences can change that you know it's not like horoscopes it's more like um something else you are balanced <laughs> presumably you're given like the biggest like the the nudge in the strongest direction in your childhood mm. um and then um you know you can you experiences you have can nudge you off off the course that was set when you were a child and you can very much get to a healthier um in a healthier direction um so it's not set in stone like you say but like because it's like experiences you had in the past are informing mm. you, how you will experience things in the future the things that happened furthest in the past or when you were like least capable of complex thought um are probably going to have the largest effect like the, the or an outside effect outsize effect sorry yeah i mean i i think so but maybe more in the sense that like um, not this is the biggest thing and so this is going to affect you forever necessarily but potentially more in a sense of this is the thing that has informed you and so it's going to continue informing you until something changes is yeah. it like it's like the automatic response that you have that you have to unlearn I guess yeah but I, I mean there are also studies that say the link between these two things isn't you know incredibly strong like mm. we we can see that there is a link between these things but thinking of them as think sort of as you were saying earlier no where you're like you see someone's how someone is and you're like well i know what your childhood was like mm. it, you can't 
be that sort of predictive on it necessarily, right? Wow. We're kind of calling uh, you out. Well, it's just the <laughs> maybe your would... childhood, or maybe you had a bad relationship later in life. Uh... <laughs> well, I think yeah, I think it's you know having a sort of predictive model about the sort of continuous relationship between um, those sort of uh, attachment styles, right? Between romantic partners and um, sort of between um, parents and infants. It's it's not as easy to sort of figure that out, right? We do think that there is um, a link, but whether or not that is, well, this means this, absolutely. That's still a bit unclear. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, if you, I'm not saying that, you know, ah, well, if your parent was like this, then you're definitely not going to be like this in relationships. Yeah, it's going to have some effect, but mm. it's not it, It's not as simple as saying, this is how you are now, therefore, that is what happened to you then. I think it's also impo very important to say um, that uh, just because things like that happening in your childhood, which are obviously outside of your control, um, having have an effect on you as an adult, that doesn't then later excuse um, bad behavior as an adult. Mm. Um, because I think often um, if you're if you're trying to make someone's behavior make sense and you go back and imagine them, oh, well, it must have been because you were this little helpless poor baby, um, you can end up excusing people's adult behavior, which is mm. not uh, not the right um, way of, of thinking about that. I agree. I think trauma is an explanation. It's never an excuse. Mm. you know. And I find that a, a lot of people struggle with that, especially when you know it comes to, I don't want to say bad behavior, but sort of, maladaptive behavior let's say or like harmful behavior to yeah. others um it can be really difficult for people to sort of you know see someone saying hey this thing that you're doing is not good i don't like it and not take it as a personal sort of mm. oh but this is from trauma and that means that i it, it hurts my feelings to hear this you can't no, like trauma is... My mom said this when I was a baby and you're trying to tell me that I shouldn't react like the way I did towards my mother yeah. when I was a baby. No, absolutely. <laughs> and that's the really difficult thing, right? Because it, it, it takes um, it takes that sort of... You're not going to be able to get out of those behaviours um, without um, sort of like actually understanding that the way that you're reacting is not a way that you should be reacting, right? I find that people sort of say, oh, this is a trauma response as though it's like... As though it's a full it's stop. A, though, yeah, well, that's it. And now it's an excusable thing. No, if you treat other people poorly, uh, you should you should make efforts to not do that, regardless of why you treat other people poorly. Because I hate to break it to you, it's not like there are just a bunch of really horrible, evil people in the world, and you're the only one that only does that does bad things to people because you had a like you had you know trauma in your past or whatever, or even trauma in your present. No, a lot of people are messed up in a lot of different ways. And a lot of people in either intentionally treat people poorly or unintentionally treat people poorly. Uh, you know, it's like, it's it's not as simple as just divvying people up into good and bad. <laughs> Insecure attachment, avoidant, anxious, secure attachment. But your honor, my my client has an insecure attachment style. Oh, okay, right, sorry, I didn't realize. Oh, he, you wasn't, go. <laughs> he wasn't hugged as a child. <laughs> but like, exactly though, right? And I, I feel like, you know, and it's interesting coming into this and I think finding out that there actually is a lot more science behind this than a lot of the other things that people are using to sort of give themselves a Hogwarts houses or whatever, right? But I think there there needs to be sort of caution with this, right? Because when we start, viewing attachment styles as a definitive uh, for uh, sort of section grouping for humanity, we kind of fall into a trap, right? Attachment styles don't exist. Attachment styles are an easy way of explaining and grouping together different responses that people have. And it's not as though these responses are sort of like, ah, you are definitively this, right? Like it's... We can predict your behavior based on this category that you might be part of. Yeah. Exactly, right? It's like you tend to have this kind of reaction. Um, and so this more this sort of more neatly fits this group. And if we put you in this group, yeah, there is some there are some things that we can maybe potentially figure out about um other areas of your life or how you might react to different situations, right? It's not about um distinct groups that actually one hundred percent definitely exist and humans just sort of happen to fall into one of the four. We made the groups up to describe how people are. Mm. Um, and when you start sort of being like, oh, he's this, he's secure attached, or he's this and that, y you should only be using it in a way to sort of elucidate behavior or like understand things, not as a sort of like, 
this is an identity that you hold. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Also, there are like other things that could determine different groups. Like some cultures raise children as a community rather than having like one primary mm. caregiver. Some kids are autistic and maybe don't want to hug their mother. Yeah. Like you can, <laughs> these, these aren't categories that like categorize the entire world. There are so many things that could like. Absolutely. You're so, and I'm glad you brought up um, different cultures as well, because, you know, as mentioned earlier, these studies were done um, you know, the, the first studies were done with American middle class folk, right? Mm. And there are plenty of things, yes, you're saying there, Noah, like raising, you know, um, kids in a community, plenty of things that could change that. And that is something else that happens a lot in science, wherein we look at a very specific group of people and we sort of say, this is how everyone is. And yeah, maybe this only describes middle class Americans. Maybe <laughs> it only describes middle class white people from a certain part of, the, you know, the world. Maybe it describes every single person on the planet, right? Um, yeah, it is probably, uh, you know, it, it, there are probably different variations that we might find in different cultures. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the key point, right? That like, you don't want to view this as a Hogwarts house. Because that's ridiculous. Because those dirty. are real and definite and you can't be divergent. Harry Potter was divert. He chose to be a Gryffindor. Yeah. He could have been. I don't, but like seriously, right? Also, if he was a Slytherin, Voldemort would have been down like that. Like, I mean, in 10 minutes, honestly, right? Like, that's the ambition there. But seriously, um, it's not Hogwarts houses. It's not sort of something that determines what your identity is. It's just... It's just an easier way of understanding the world by grouping a lot of vaguely similar people together, right? Just quickly on that, what you said there, it's so fascinating how many of our studies would have to be caveated, especially up until five or ten years ago when we started getting a little bit better at this, with like the caveat of like, this is how, this is not how humans behave mm -hmm. or how humans behave always. This is like how humans behave in a nuclear family probably straight family um, in a capitalist system in the Western world with one primary caregiver probably in, in the 70s um, who's probably a woman um, and the other one is not very is not around as much because they're working all the time and when they're not working they're tired like there's so many caveats and we don't really know how a human would behave outside of all of those uh, extra sort of um, clarifications no absolutely and just from a quick look it seems that attachment styles are kind of consistent across cultures but the sort of percentage makeup of each one is different across all cultures though secure attachment style is the most common one that Aww, sort of invariably that's good yeah that's good to know yeah well i think i've seen from 50 to 75 percent depending on where you go i think britain wasn't doing it look it doesn't really matter um, <laughs> oh no all i'm saying is that uh yeah i mean you've got to think more broadly when it comes to a lot of these topics right and yeah i don't super love seeing people say things like oh i wouldn't like i wouldn't date this person with that attachment style or like yeah they're doing this because of that attachment style and sort of writing off people's behavior or writing off people in a certain way uh, because of that because again i don't think we should be using those in that way this this is something that we can use to understand broadly how infants react and then again kind of broadly to understand how people might um, interact in relationships. But there are so many variables going on, right? There are so many things that influence a person and so many different things that can happen within a relationship that like being like, oh, this is your attachment style. Of four of, of like how many people are there? Like seven billion, eight billion like people, right? Let's round up to eight billion. There are eight billion people. You splitting them into four different groups and you're making judgments on that. I mean, we've split them into two. <laughs> and two and a bit True. you know two and a like, bit I feel like that's that's worse it is worse it is much worse yeah um, and so Noah what, what group what group is that you're talking about um, short and tall get rid of the short tall divide now give me stilts redistribute the height <laughs> <laughs> but you know I mean it's a difficult thing when you've got something that kind of describes uh, groups of people and people start using that to be um, maybe a little bit more specific than they should be it describes babies well in, in those current moments. Yeah, uh, that's true. But bear in mind that when it comes to babies, we can't ask them how they're feeling and we can only really see how they're feeling by measuring their heart rate and seeing if they cry or not. So splitting them into four groups is probably, it, it makes sense, right? If you were to ask the babies how they felt, maybe there'd be more groups, you know? More, more people should do that, I think. They should ask. Right. Well, on that note, I think it's time for the quick fire quiz. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Attachment style edition. So the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after finish answering the question wins. What do they win? They win me coming back into the room and giving them a hug. <laughs> and what is your buzzer? Ah! And what is your buzzer? Wow! Very good. So my question for you is... 
Name three of the attachment styles. Question mark. Ah, Luke. Anxious. Avoidant. Mm. Secure. Mm. And detached. No. Ah, ah, Ooh, no. No, wait, if you can name literally one more. Disorganized. Yeah, there we go. Ding, ding, ding. Well done, Noah. You win a hug from Luke after he comes, oh, back, in, after he comes I, back in the oh, room. I'm already back in the room. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's pretty much all from us. Noah, is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, uh, I just finished a tour with Ed Shikari, which was really cool. But if you're watching from America or Canada, I'm on tour very soon. Buy a ticket. Yeah. You heard him, and that's all from us. But before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Danito and Glitch Rabbit, and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday, and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash guys, or you can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me to to Noah's tour in America. <laughs> where I won't be, but you will be. You can follow me at No Offense everywhere apart from Twitter where it's No Fed Adams and TikTok where it's The No Offense. Buy a ticket. Buy it. Bye bye. I'm leaving the room now. Try not to cry about it. I'll see you later. I'll be off. <laughs> if you care. <laughs>